Hi, I'm Andy Fandango. I've got a souped up BBC Master computer from the 1980s and a few months ago I wrote a basic program to play a splendid arcade game. Now I want to go proper old school and write an ASCII game using the character set provided just like the old computers of the late 70s that didn't have fancy high res graphics. You needed real ingenuity to get a computer to play a good game, but to get any performance from an original 8-bit I'm going to have to use machine code, the ancient art of programming the CPU directly. Here we have a typical 8-bit computer with the CPU and 64K of memory. There's a 16-bit address bus telling the memory what the CPU wants to look at next and an 8-bit data bus returning a byte of data at a time. The CPU will also write to memory when it needs to. The CPU has a program counter which points to the next address to fetch instructions from and each address contains machine code, binary encoded instructions often presented in neat two-digit hexadecimal. The machine code translates directly to more human readable assembly language made up of three character monomics. The program counter works sequentially through memory returning instructions to the CPU until it gets to a jump or branch instruction when it moves to a new address in memory. Most 8-bit computers of the 80s came with memory split into RAM for the user data and read-only ROM containing operating system features and a basic interpreter. These are just machine code routines used by the system to make it useful. A basic program is just text sitting in RAM, sometimes tokenized to save space and make interpretation easier. The code in the ROM gives the user facilities to edit BASIC through a simple command line. When you run the BASIC program, you start the interpreter in ROM. It has to decode your BASIC one line at a time and work out what to do with it. So you effectively have a program running a program in real time, line by line. That makes BASIC very easy to use and its syntax is much easier to understand than assembly language. But it's slow. Far too slow for arcade games. Unless you cheat and have a modern Raspberry Pi coprocessor. I'm using my standard 8-bit BBC Model B for two main reasons. The first one is that BBC BASIC allows embedded assembly language and has an assembler built in. The second reason is Mode 7. Originally designed for Teletext compatibility, it's a 1000 byte, 40 column, character only display mode. Its compact size but flexible presentation made it ideal for things like loading screens back in a time when games came on slow loading tapes. And there were even games that used Mode 7 fairly successfully, great if you only had a 16K Model A. But it has its idiosyncrasies. The alphanumeric characters are as expected, but when it gets to symbols, they move away from the ASCII standard and more towards sending information to your TV screen. But it does have some good features. You can embed control codes to do some interesting things. Here we change the text colour to green, but it comes at the cost of this blank character which we can't do anything with. You can also do zany stuff like double height text. So if we combine control characters we can combine effects. Double height multicoloured text, but we pay the price of two blank characters. All these control codes are documented in the back of the BBC Micro User Guide along with this table of the graphics characters. They have every combination of 2x3 blocky graphics which makes it possible to put together some effective but very shoddy images. Now let's combine Mode 7 and Machine Code. Here's a program to display some characters on the screen. First thing is to go into Mode 7 and calculate an address in the video memory space, five lines down. Then I'll reserve some memory for the assembler to put the machine code in. A thousand bytes is plenty for this. Now we have a big for loop because we want the assembler to do two passes. We set this opt value so the first pass doesn't report errors and it can record forward references such as label addresses. On the second pass, we do want to report errors because they'll be important now. 
We set the assembler location counter P% to point to the memory we reserved. Then between the square brackets we can put our assembly language and any labels we want prefixed with a dot. So now it's time for a very quick introduction to assembly language. The BBC Micro uses a 6502 processor. It has three 8-bit registers, A, the accumulator, X and Y. There are also several flags set as the result of various operations. To get data into a register, use a load instruction. To get data out into memory, use a store instruction. You can also push and pull onto a stack. You can add and subtract with carry on the accumulator and do binary operations like shifts or AND. You can increment and decrement memory and the X and Y registers, which is great for loops and indexing. Comparison operators set flags, which can then be used for conditional branches. You can call and return from routines or do absolute jumps, a bit like GoTo in BASIC. I know assembly language. Now let's run our program. This is the output of the assembler. There are four columns. The first is the address in memory shown as a four digit hex number. Next is the machine code at that address grouped by instruction. The third column shows any labels we defined. And the final column is the assembly language mnemonics and operands. When I press a key to call the machine code, we instantly get 80 characters displayed. For a game I want to be able to define a character based sprite like this weird looking thing. We need to transfer this design into continuous memory to use later. We only need to do this once at the start so we could just do it in basic. Then during the game we need to take that definition and transfer it quickly to the screen many times. We need this to be fast so it will be written in machine code. We'll also need to be able to move the sprite to any position on the screen. I'm going to reserve a chunk of memory for graphics definitions. And here is some code in BASIC with our sprite represented as strings sent to a function add data from string. The function scans over the string and puts it in memory, returning the next address so the calls can be chained. That's this bit of the plan done. I'm going to use a simple lookup table to translate the size of my square sprites to the length required in memory. For example a size 3 sprite uses 9 bytes of memory. This is to avoid some costly multiplications in code. So now let's quickly look at the code to draw the sprite on screen. At the top I have some labels where I've reserved a few bytes of data using no operation instructions. I'll keep position and size past the routine here. I could do this on the stack but I didn't. Then I have some working data here that I'll calculate in the routine. Now I set up a pointer to where I want to start on the screen. I store this in a zero page address because the processor can do fast relative indexing from data stored here. Now I check the size is greater than zero, store it as the line count, work out the line offset for when I need to go to the next line and look up the size in memory to use as my loop counter in Y. This is the main loop for each character. We decrease Y on each iteration until it reaches zero. We load data as an offset from the pointer to our graphics data and then store it in an offset to the working screen pointer. We increase the screen offset until we get to the end of a line where we then change the screen pointer to the next line. When we've done every Y loop we return from the routine. And this is the basic code to set up a single call. We set the p-obj to point to a graphic definition, set the position on screen, set the sprite size and the base screen address pointer. Then I call draw. And as if by magic I have an odd looking ASCII thing on the screen. So now that's this bit done as well. That's great but I'd quite like to animate these sprites. So I'm going to add a frame input. We need a bit of extra code to work out the address of the source data based on the frame and the size of the sprite and then adjust the object pointer to the data. Now I can add multiple frames in continuous memory using the same add data from string function I used before. I think you'll agree the results speak for themselves.
It's quite a nice ASCII explosion. Now I've got some building blocks for Mode 7 graphics, I've got to work out what the game should be. I've scribbled down some ideas on my pad, and I think I have a plan of sorts. Oh! In the next episode, I'll start to explore how I'm going to make this into something more like a playable game. And describe some of the digital cow pats I've had to avoid stepping in to get there.